Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. Just getting the meeting rolling. Sorry that I'm starting it close to the class period, but anyway, um, not to worry. Good to be with you guys. And um, yeah, just about 10 seconds and we're getting things rolling. But feel free to say hi or say anything in the chat. <clears throat> Hi, David, Spencer, good to see you guys. Welcome back. So let's just get rolling, I guess. It's 2.30. Um, good to be with everyone, as I was saying. Um, Peachy says hello. Um, and yeah, today what we're doing, actually, one second, I just need to close a window over here. There's a little noise pollution, so I'll be right back. One second. guys sorry for that oh almost dropped my sparkling water okay I'm good to go now thank you all right so um what we're doing today is we're just gonna try and finish up these notes on the Gettier problem and uh, Gettier's essay we had made some progress through it but we didn't get all the way done so that's the first order of business to just kind of finish off those notes and then uh, we'll try to transition into um, our discussion for Rene Descartes and his famous book called The Meditations. So the goal is to finish Gettier and then talk about Descartes. Hopefully we can do both of those things today. If not, we'll push whatever we need to into the next uh, meeting. So yeah, good to see everybody here. I see everyone in the chat. Um, to those that have emailed me seeking great uh, requests for the midterm, I'm going through all of your messages and I'm definitely getting back to you guys. Um, I've replied to everyone who has messaged me up until 3.48 p.m. on Monday. So I think the next one is um, Ashley Gomez and then Jack Page. And then those will be the last couple of people that emailed me on Monday. If you email me on Tuesday, then I'll be getting back to you guys either later tonight or tomorrow in the morning. But anyways, yes, I am answering uh, emailed questions about grades. And I invite people that have not yet done so to send me a message if you want, and I'll help you understand your grade uh, for the midterm or anything else if you don't already know. Okay, <clears throat> so then, cool. Let me then just take us back into this topic of the Gettier problem, and we'll finish it up from there. So we're talking about epistemology in the past few meetings. That's the theory of knowledge within philosophy. What is knowledge? What's the difference between really having knowledge and just guessing? Um, and the first look that we had at this was to study the writings of the ancient Greeks in particular Plato and his teacher Socrates. Um, the ancient classical account of knowledge is that knowledge is equivalent to justified true belief. So according to millennia of tradition, starting way back 400 BC, the idea was that when you have knowledge, three things have to be happening. First of all, you have to think something's true, and that's just believing something. But believing something's true is not the same thing as knowing it. Otherwise, people that are like losing their minds and that believe that, you know, um, like, I don't know, the demons are chasing them or something, then that would be knowledge too. But we only say that it's knowledge when the belief at least is true. So believing something means you think it's true. But when it is true, that means that whatever the belief is about corresponds to the actual facts. So a true belief is two parts of our definition. But then there's one more, which is justification. They say that for you to know something, you must think it's true, and it actually is, and then you've got good evidence or reasons that you could give as a backing for that true belief that you've got. Um, if any of the conditions was not met, then that would not be the case of knowledge. So if you have a belief which you're justified in believing, but it's false, then that's not something you know because you have a false belief. If you have a true belief, but you don't have any reason to think so, then you're just guessing, and that's not real knowledge, even if it is a correct guess. Um, now, in the dialogue that Plato writes called the Mino. There's this conversation between Plato and Mino. Sorry, Socrates and Mino. Thank you. Plato's the writer. Socrates is usually the teacher and the character in these writings. So Socrates and Mino are talking and he says, um, suppose someone knows how to get to Larissa, couldn't they lead other people there? Mino is like, yeah, that could happen. If a person knows how to get there, sure, they could lead someone. Then he asks, what if someone didn't really know they've never been there? 
but they do have a correct opinion. Like for example, they've got a accurate map. Wouldn't that just as well work in substitute for knowledge, just having the correct opinion? Correct opinion, in other words, a true belief without justification. And Mino says yes to this too. So then the question becomes, well, why do people think knowledge is better than just having a lucky guess or a correct opinion? And essentially what Socrates ends up saying is that there's a reason knowledge is valued and prized more highly than just correct opinions. The reason is because with knowledge, it comes packaged together with justification. A correct opinion is just the other two pieces, true belief with no justification. But having that additional element of justification adds something because what it adds, he says, is that it prevents the belief from leaving your mind. It compares this by means of a metaphor. Do you remember the metaphor, anybody? Who could tell me what he compares these, uh, the concept of justification to? Is that something you can tell me? Mr. Socrates says that if you want some kind of an analogy, think of justification as something similar to the ropes. That's right, Jasmine. They're similar to these ropes that would hold down and lock down the Daedalus sculptures. The Daedalus sculptures are beautiful works of art. They're masterpieces of sculpture. They were so realistic, they thought that if you didn't tie them with ropes, they would just run away when you weren't looking. Now, in the same kind of sense, when you have a true belief, that's great. But if it's not locked down and based on evidence, then it's going to leave your mind. You won't retain that information. So wouldn't you rather have a true belief that you get to keep instead of just having it here today and gone tomorrow? Just like these statues, wouldn't you rather have one that you get to hold on to instead of just having it for a brief moment and then it runs off because you didn't put ropes on it. So you want to put ropes on your true beliefs. In other words, you want to put justification behind them because otherwise you're not going to remember that stuff or you're just going to change your mind about it. Okay, from there, we've opened up this discussion of Edmund Gettier. And to get the discussion of Gettier started, this is just me reviewing for the beginning for now. Gettier begins by saying, okay, there's a classical definition of knowledge that everyone has heard and it's justified true belief, which I just went through. He says sometimes people state it a little differently. Sometimes people say that believing something is accepting it. Sometimes people saying having justification is having adequate evidence for it. But however people formulate the description of knowledge, they always amount to the same three things. True belief that is justified. Now, Gettier says, I have a problem with this analysis, though. This is not actually correct. And before he gives us his examples, which I'm going to show you in a minute, he has these two preliminary points. One of them was the point that it's possible to have a justified false belief. Yeah, it's possible to have a justified false belief. So, um, like, suppose that um, I believe that someone is alive and well because I just talked to them earlier in the morning. You know, that would be justified. I would have no reason to think anything had happened to them. But maybe it would be false if unexpectedly they've gone through, like, a terrible accident or medical emergency, like a heart attack later on in the same day. If you had told me that, I'd be like, wow, I wouldn't have thought so. And I would have been justified in not thinking so, given their clean bill of health leading up to it. But sometimes you can have justified beliefs that, despite the evidence, uh, turn out to be false. Mistaken convictions, false accusations based on reasonable evidence, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, the other preliminary point he makes is that the closure principle is true. Now, let's try and make sure to remember this closure principle one time, yeah? The closure principle says what? That if there is a person who's justified in believing a statement and then they notice that that initial statement entails a second one, then in that case, if they deduce the second one off of the first, now they're also justified in believing that second statement. So, I mean, um, I know you're my student in this class, so that's something I believe because I'm dealing with you and grading your work, right? So I believe you're my student and I'm justified in believing it because of the evident fact that you attend these meetings and submit work to me. Um, and you're on my grade roster and all kinds of other things. So I have great evidence to base my belief that you are a student at Cal State Fullerton. Suppose that I start doing my logic in the head and I'm like, well, what's something that that entails? To be a college student, that entails that you at least graduated high school. So now I have deduced this second statement from the first. The closure principle merely says this, that when you do an operation like that, arrive at a justified belief, notice that it logically implies something other than that, then you can also be justified in believing that implication because you just deduce it off of the first thing. Okay, so now we have the Gettier cases to expl explain. And with all the preliminaries in place, we can do that. So the first Gettier case, which I was telling you about at the end of the last meeting, is called Gettier case one, and even more memorable of a title, 
Um, Smith and Jones job hunt. Smith and Jones job hunt, Gettier's first case. And by the way, if you have forgotten, what is his name? It's Edmund Gettier. And he's still alive and kicking, but he was born in 1927. And this paper that we're talking about, which I'm uh, breaking down for you, it's from 1963, and it's called, Is Justified True Belief Knowledge? And Gettier is out to, to show the audience that, no, it's not. About Gettier, did I tell you guys this weird fact that he only ever published this one thing and then he just left philosophy after? I mean, he didn't leave philosophy, he kept teaching and stuff, but he only published one work. That's also kind of an interesting fact about his biography. Okay, so anyway, Gettier's paper, his name, his dates, but let's focus on the actual content now. I just wanted to remind you of the title and everything over here. Okay, Gettier case one, Smith and Jones job. So we've got a couple of characters in this little situation. First of all, there's Smith. There's Smith. And then you got Jones. Let's say there's a Jones here. And then you've got the boss guy who's going to ultimately make the decision about hiring. Boss. Um, <clears throat> to create additional room, I can clear this away. You know now that's the title of the case. Okay. So let's just remember a couple of points. There's a job hunt going on. There's one open position at the company. Smith and Jones are the two people that are competing against each other for that final position, and the boss is going to decide which one is going to be. So he's interviewed both of Smith and Jones, and he's making his mind up about who to choose. I think I told you guys uh, as we were closing the last meeting that Smith uh, develops a belief in his mind. And here's the thought bubble again to just kind of show what that belief is of Smith. Does anybody remember? Based on notes or memory, what Mr. Smith's belief is, let me know that, and then I'll put it in our bubble here. Smith ends up believing something for certain reasons that we'll get into, but what was it? There's a proposition Smith believes based on some events that play out here in the interview and afterwards. What is it? <clears throat> let me know. The belief of Smith. Okay, Alicia, that Jones will get the job and... You say he, which becomes a little grammatically ambiguous because Smith is also a male, but yeah, I know what you mean. That Jones will get the job and, but well, you're doing it also, Tina. Jones will get the job and Jones has 10 coins in his pocket. Very good, yes. Okay, so Jones will get the job. And Jones has 10 coins in his pocket. Now we are going to label this, for the sake of convenience, D. Just this, this belief, this proposition that, that Smith believes in his mind is labeled D. D stands for Jones will get the job and Jones has 10 coins in his pocket. Now, uh, who can tell me this? Why does Smith think that? What is the reason that Smith believes that? What is his evidence or justification for thinking that D is true? Just walk me through that one more time or all the other students too. Let's all remember this together. What is the reason that Smith thinks that is true? There's very specific reasons. He's not just guessing. He has, you know, a basis here. Okay, so the boss told him what, though, David? Because there's two parts here. It's a conjunction. It has and in it. So based on what you've said, uh, it leaves the question open. What, what part of the statement did the boss tell him? But very good. Just kind of following up on your comment. What did the boss tell him? <clears throat> yeah, that's right, David. The boss told him that Jones would get the job. And then separately from that, Jasmine, very good. Do you guys remember this other part? Because, David, you didn't mention it. And Tina also, you didn't mention it. But you guys have all talked about why the, you know, the boss telling him that Jones would get the job, yes. But there's this other thing, too, and uh, Alicia, you're pointing it out. Also, Jasmine, you're pointing it out. The other part is that Smith literally counts the coins in Jones' pocket. And when he counts those coins, he counts 10 exactly. So 
there's two pieces of justification, two pieces of evidence that form this belief. One piece is the boss's statement to Smith, given privately, that he would hire Jones. And the other piece is the act of counting the coins out of Jones' pocket and seeing that there's 10. So now he's arrived at the belief D. And I just hope we can agree on this, that he's justified in believing D. I mean, right? It's not like he's just giving a wild guess. He has specific reasons to believe D. The boss who hires told him the first part, so why would he doubt that? You know, he has no reason to, dis to think that he's not telling the truth. And secondly, he did the act of counting. So that's as good as evidence could get. You know, when you counted them yourself, you know there's 10 coins there. So now, here's where that closure principle thing is going to kick in. I told you that's going to come back, and it's coming back now. So we already said that Smith is now justified in this belief based on the reasons that we've talked about. Now, suppose that he, Smith, uh, is a fan of logic and such, and so he notices that this entails a similar but slightly changed statement. Remember what entailment is, by the way. Entailment happens when one statement entails another. When a statement entails another, that means that if the first one is true, the second one has to be true. As an example, last time I told you guys that I was born in the 80s, which is true, and then I asked you to figure something out that that entails. And after a couple of awkward failed attempts, we got to the concept that I'm at least 30. That has to be true because a person who's alive in 2021 that was born in the 80s must be at a minimum 30 if they were born at any particular date during the whole decade. They don't have to be 40, but they have to at least be 30 today. So that's entailed. If A is I was born in 80s, B being I'm at least 30, A entails B. Now, in this case, D is our first statement believed by Smith. Let's suppose that he's using logic and he deduces something from it, and let's call that second statement E which Gettier does in the paper too. So I'm just following Gettier's, you know, example. Smith deduces from D the proposition E. And what E says is similar to D, but there's just this one slight edit. And here's how it looks. The man who gets the job. Has what? Ten coins in his pocket. Okay, so I want you guys to see this piece at least. D entails E. D entails E. So if D is true, look what it says. If this is true, it means that Jones gets the job and Jones has 10 coins in his pocket. But if that is true, then of course this has to be true because if Jones has the job and, gets, and has the 10 coins, then the man who gets the job has 10 coins in his pocket, namely, parenthesis, Jones. But we don't have to make reference to his name in this case because it's implied by the information over here. So Smith was justified in believing D. D entails E. Smith, who knows why, but deduces E from D. And so according to the closure principle, what is the status of the proposition E now? Smith has arrived at E through deduction, through entailment. And he was already initially justified in the prior statement D. So can we put that little situation together? Tell me, what is the uh, status of E? This is something that Smith now believes, and it's what kind of belief? According to the closure principle. Well, David, not so much that it must be true, because the closure principle doesn't say that if you have one belief, then the other belief must be true. It's a principle about the transmission of justification across deduction. So not quite, David, sorry to say. Tina and Alicia, you have it. E is also justified. That is correct. E is justified because D is justified, and E is just a consequence of D. So all of this little backstory, guys, was just to get us to this point in the hypothetical scenario to see how, given the situation described, Smith now has a justified belief in this statement E. Now, working backwards, this is justified. Why? Because it follows off of this, and why is this justified? because the boss told him Jones would get the job, and because Smith separately counted the coins in Jones' pocket. So that's his basic evidence for D, which transfers right over to E, because E is a consequence of D. Smith is justified in believing E, period. Now, after this, the Gettier case reaches its climax or conclusion, and um, there's always this like kind of funny plot twist at the end of a Gettier case. So let me try and explain that to you. In every Gettier case, and we call them Gettier cases because the literature has spawned like a wave of different 
permutations of such cases as these. So Gettier started it with, you know, this. This is the original, the OG first Gettier case. But after he wrote this in 1963, there have been thousands and thousands of spinoffs of this and all kinds of little variations. So anyway, in every Gettier case, whether it's this one or the others that have been developed later, there's always this like little surprise ending. And the thing that happens at the end of a Gettier case is that the relevant proposition turns out to be true, but for an unexpected reason. So it's sort of like the individual ended up having a true belief, but just by luck. The factor that makes the proposition true in the end is completely separated and disconnected from the evidence that they used to arrive at that justified belief. So here's how it goes in the end. Boss comes back into the room where Smith and Jones are sitting there. And he walks straight past Jones with his hand out like he's going to extend a hand for a handshake. And he's going towards Smith. And Smith is a little confused, like, what are you doing? But then the boss with a big smile looks at Smith and he's like, surprise, Smith, I got some news for you. Remember earlier when I was telling you that I was going to hire Jones? No disrespect to you, Jones, but Smith, I'm just a big joker. I like to play around with people, get reactions out of folks and stuff. And so what I was doing earlier, I was just saying that I was going to hire Jones just to kind of get a reaction out of you, see how you would react. But to be real with you, now I'm being honest. You're the suitable candidate, Smith. You're the best you know, um, eligible candidate. And I've actually decided to hire you. So congratulations, Smith. Surprise. I know you said, I know I told you earlier I was hiring Jones, but I was only kidding. And now for real, it's you. So you're going to start tomorrow. Congratulations. You're a part of the team. Smith got hired. Okay. Smith didn't think he was going to get hired. He had relied on the earlier statement of the boss that it would be Jones. So he's surprised by this. But now this is a total coincidence, guys, because Smith had no knowledge at all about the content of his own pocket and he did not count it. But it just turns out by a sheer coincidence, unbeknownst to Smith, he actually does happen to have what? What do you think will be our plot twist here? So one plot twist is surprise, the boss hires Smith, not Jones. And then the other piece is that just by a total coincidence, randomly, Smith also happens to have what? Let me ask. That's right, Jasmine. He also happens to have 10 coins in his pocket. Now, he didn't know that. He just had some change in there that randomly happened to be 10 coins. So let's look back at E. Did Smith believe E? Yes, because he deduced it off of D. Was Smith justified in believing E? Yes, according to the closure principle, since he was already justified here, he simply used logic to arrive at this further justified belief here. And then one more big question. At the end of the situation and the scenario given, is E true? Is proposition E true at the end of the day after all of these facts of this hypothetical have been presented? Is E true simply? Yes, it is true. It is true because it matches the facts. What does it say? It says the man who gets the job has 10 coins in his pocket. Now, who got the job? Smith. And does he have 10 coins in his pocket? Uh, yes. So what that means is that E, this proposition, is a what, what, what? It's a belief of Smith. It was justified for Smith to believe it based on the evidence he had. And it actually did turn out to be true. So it is actually a justified true belief. But here we get the real final result. Although it is a JTB, common sense tells you that this is not actually a statement that is what? Although it's a justified true belief, due to the weird, fluky, random way that it turned out to be true, it's just a matter of luck and chance that it turned out to be true, given the way he formed his evidence, we would say it's a justified true belief, but it fails to be what? It's a JTB, but it's not a case of what? That's for you to answer. So this is like the real... The whole point. We've shown that it's not knowledge, right? It's a justified true belief, but it's not knowledge because knowledge cannot be when you get something right just by dumb luck or chance. Knowledge is when you get it right because of the evidence that you use to form the belief. But in this case, the evidence that he's relying on has nothing to do with him. He thinks that the man that will get the job has 10 coins in his pocket because he thinks it'll be Jones and he knows that Jones has that number of coins. So he would be completely surprised to find out this is true if he didn't think that Jones was going to get the job because he doesn't even know that he has 10 coins in his own pocket. So the belief, although it is true and believed by the subject and justified, it's just, just pure chance and luck that it turned out being true. So it's true, but not because of any of the evidence that he used to form the belief itself. So there's a mismatch between the factors that make the belief true and then the re reasons that he formed the belief in terms of his justification. So that doesn't strike the intuition of anybody as a real situation where someone has knowledge. But what this shows, 
as weird as the example is, right, what it shows is that we've proven a counterexample to the equation that the Greeks gave. The Greeks said this, that K knowledge is equal to JTB. But not in this case. This is a situation where it's not equal. It's a justified true belief, but it still isn't knowledge. And so what Gettier shows is that that stated definition of knowledge is incomplete. The real analysis of knowledge, what he's exposing here, is that it's justified true belief plus something extra, plus question mark. And what is that extra feature to add to the definition? That's where we still are not yet um, in a position to give a full consensus. There's been many different attempts to try and um, fix the definition of knowledge, add something to it, change it so that it overcomes these counterexamples, but none have yet formed one core definition that everyone can agree on. So since Gettier did his thing, we're all kind of spinning our wheels trying to modify the definition of knowledge in a way that will not allow such examples as these, but it's very difficult to do that. The extra condition's got to be something along these lines, an anti-luck condition, a condition that guarantees that when you got this belief correct, you didn't just get it right for some random lucky reason, but that the reason that you got it right is like reliable and it would have also been correct if we modified the situation just slightly. But it's very hard to specify the parameters of this anti-luck condition. I have my own views about which kind of solution I think is the best, but that's still something that's hotly debated within the, the academic field of epistemology. So anyway, that's one Gettier case. I want to try and also talk to you guys while we have this time together about some other spin-off versions of Gettier cases that I think are a little bit more relatable. I mean, to be fair, his case, there's some weird stuff in there, counting another guy's coins and whatever. Um, so... Let me give you one that really did happen to me, and I think that makes it something that's, I don't know, a little bit easier to, to think about, right? Even though this shouldn't be impossible. I mean, there's the, there's the deduction piece and, like, how the justification transfers over. If you can master that part, like, okay, he's justified in E through the closure principle, and E is true, but not for any of the reasons that he used in forming this belief, then you, you can see the point. But um, here, let me give you another example. Okay, so I drive around in a... BMW car. I have a black BMW car, and um, it's kind of a make and a model that you you sometimes see. I mean, I see a lot of black BMW driving around in park parking lots. So anyway, one time I was parking at one of the campuses where I teach, and I was in a real rush because I was kind of running late for my class. So I just wanted to get out of the car, get to the room, and I was doing that quickly. So in the rush, I didn't necessarily take in a very solid memory of the location or the aisle where the car was parked. My main priority was get out of the car, get to class. So I'm coming back after class later in the day, returning to my car to drive home. And my thought is, where's the car? You know, which aisle is my car? And I kind of don't remember. So I walk around in the lot in the basic area where I thought it was. And I see a black BMW that I think is mine. And so right at that moment, based on the image that I see with my eyes, I form this belief. In that moment, my belief was my car is in that aisle. Fair enough, right? I saw the aisle. I saw a car matching mine. And I thought, that's my car, so my car's in that aisle. So that was a belief. And maybe we can say it's justified because it was based on visual evidence of a car with a very similar appearance. So what was the belief? My car is in this aisle based on the image that I saw. But... As you know, it's a Gettier case, so there's going to be a little plot twist, guys. I got closer to the car, and what do you think I noticed? Oops, mistaken identity. I thought it was mine, but this is just a very similar BMW with a black um, paint job. And so it wasn't my car. But now that I got up close to that one, I noticed something two cars down in the same aisle, which I did not see before. Two cars away from that car in the same aisle, there actually was what? What do you think? How will this little story finish off? So Voolish is looking for his car in the lot. He goes to the lot, he sees one, and it's like, that's mine. So my car is in the aisle. I go close to it, oops, not mine. But then two cars in the same aisle over, there's my car. Good, David. So let's take stock of the case I'm mentioning. What was my belief? My car is in this aisle. Well, Jasmine, let's be clear. It wasn't just another black BMW, it was mine. Okay, so let me finish. I saw a different car, and my belief based on that other car was that it was mine, so I thought my car is in this aisle, right? Now, 
when I got close to the one car, I noticed that it actually wasn't mine. But despite that, just by luck, unseen by me initially, there actually was my car in the aisle, two stalls down. So what was the belief? My car is in the aisle. Now, was I justified in believing it? Yes. Was it true in the end, the proposition that my car is in this aisle? Was it true? That's a question. Just let me know real quick your answer. Did the proposition turn out being true? The thing I believed, that my car was in that aisle, was that, was that the case? I didn't lose you on this last question, right? Go ahead. Let me know. Yes, of course. It was true. The statement that my car is in that aisle was a true statement. It matched the facts. That was the aisle my car was in. So let's ask this. Do you think I actually, well, let me be a little more patient and slow. I had a justified true belief then in the statement that my car was in that aisle. The justification, though, was formed on the basis of a different visual perception, not the perception of my actual car, but a similar looking one. So I had a justified true belief that my car was in that aisle. But do you guys want to say that I knew that my car was in that aisle? Come on. I didn't know it was in that aisle. I was just lucky that the false appearance of the other car directed me towards the actual place where my car was parked. But had I parked in any other aisle, then I would have had a justified false belief. So I had a justified true belief, but, but just due to luck, just because of the random chance that another car matching my description was in that aisle, thus providing me with the basis for the justified belief that coincidentally turned out to be true. So in this case, the little plot twist is, oh wait, the one you saw wasn't actually your car, but ha ha, your car is in that aisle. So I guess you got lucky to get the belief correct despite the mismatch between the evidence and the factor that made your belief true. And I'll just hit you with a few more of these because I don't know if I said this, but I'm, I'm like an epistemologist, right? So like the um, papers that I've published and books that I've edited and stuff and my whole graduate career was really focused a lot on these type of topics and philosophies. So I've spent a lot of time, uh, for better or worse, thinking about these inane little arcane cases. So here's another one. These are some in the literature. This one's from Robert Nozick, another author in our book that I didn't assign him to you but I'll give you like what I think is the best piece of his article. It's another get your case. So suppose that um, you're on all kinds of drugs. Well, maybe you're not on the drugs, okay? Someone else is on all kinds of big drugs and they're hallucinating and seeing things. So when they're on these drugs having hallucinations, um, before I continue, let me see your questions and comments. I see some coming in. Jack, but if you had to guess it was in that aisle without seeing the car, Without seeing the car, would that be knowledge? Well, the question then is, would it be justification? I think if I was just randomly guessing, we wouldn't say it's justification because I'm not using evidence. I'm just like hypothesizing and speculating without any kind of basis. Um, when it happened, did I think of Gettier? Yes, I did, Spencer, because I'm always thinking of Gettier constantly. To be honest with you, yeah, whenever any situation happens where I'm like, oh, <laughs> That's a surprise that I got it right because I was relying on different evidence. I always think of the Gettier case. So like if I'm out shopping or something, uh, one time this happened. You want another one from my life? I was out at the store and why did I go? Because I thought that we were out of paper towels at, at home. And so I had a roommate, this is back in college. So I went to the store thinking we need paper towels. And because I thought we needed paper towels, I thought, it, I thought we needed a paper product. When I got there though, I get a text and the text is like, hey, we actually have a bunch of paper towels in this other pantry but I'm glad that you're at the store because we need toilet paper. And so my belief initially was we need a paper product. It was based on other evidence though. It was based on the false belief that we were out of paper towels when in fact we were fully stocked and what we were actually out of was a different paper product. So I guess my belief ended up being true and I had some reasons to think so. Um, but you would not like to say that I knew that we needed a paper product given the fact that I was relying on justification that mismatches the actual case. There's another one, but I was going to give you the thing with drugs or whatever. So suppose that there's a person on all the different drugs. They're seeing stuff. They're hallucinating. And so in front of them, they see what they think is an elephant in the room. So based on this hallucinatory image, they form a belief. There's an elephant in the room here. Now, of course, that's not a real elephant. It's just an illusion. But suppose that um, tucked away behind a wall, which the person cannot see, there actually is a what in the room? What do you think is the uh, example here? A little plot twist of this get your case. So you guys on drugs, seeing, sees what he thinks is an elephant, belief pops in his head, there's an elephant here in this room. Despite the false hallucination, behind a wall in the same room, there actually was a what? Can you tell me what you think the case will be? Yes. 
Yes, well, uh, you say stuffed elephant. I was going to even make it a little more outrageous, but, you know, closer to the fact. So, like, there's a baby elephant sleeping over there. I don't know, behind this partition. Maybe this is in some kind of, you know, zoo or animal preserve. But at any rate, that person had the belief there's an ele uh, elephant in the room. And they based it on some hallucinatory visual evidence, which I guess could be a justification of a sort. So they had a justified belief based on that perception that there's an elephant in the room. And it was true, but it was true for a completely different reason. It was true because of the sight unseen in a different portion of the room. And their evidence was derived from the visual perception and the hallucination. So no one would really say they knew there was an elephant there. They got it right, but it's another coincidence. Okay, now I'm going to hit you with one last one. But I could keep going forever, but I got one more because this is another kind of famous one. And in a video that I'll send around at some point, um, I'll maybe include this because it's in there. So another Gettier case could be suppose someone's driving, driving along the road. They look to the right, and in a big open field, they see what they think is a barn. To all appearances, it looks like a barn. You no, know? you see the characteristic, I don't know, red wall, little roof. It looks like a barn over there. So you believe, hey, in that field to the right, there's a barn. Now here's the thing. If you had gotten out and come closer to the so-called barn, you would have seen something, that it's not a barn. It's actually just an art piece. This is an art installation. It's a facade. It's a single wall. So there's no interior. And there's no depth. But it's a wall that's designed to look like a barn from the perspective of the driver on the road. So what you looked at, thinking it's a barn, it's not a barn. It's a wall. But behind the wall, which you cannot see from the position of the driver, there actually is what sitting behind that wall. Another example, what's the answer? The, uh, the fake barn, behind it, there's what? <laughs> yeah, real barn, that's right, Isaac, you got it. So what was the belief in this example? There's a barn in that field. Is it true that there's a barn in that field? Yes, but you can't see it from the driver's point of view, what you can see is the fake barn that will make you think there's a barn in the field. So here again, do we really want to say this guy knows there's a barn over there? I mean, he doesn't know it. He got it right. But the basis for his belief is not connected to the actual barn. So anyway, in all the different examples that we've talked about, they spawned from the original from Gettier. There's actually two Gettier cases in the essay, but I wanted to just kind of talk about the first one and then go over these other spin-off versions that future authors after him developed. Um, now look, as weird as some of these cases may be, they actually show something quite important and deep, that we don't have a closed and complete definition of knowledge today. We think that it's something about getting a true belief, and it's something about evidence, and that is all fair and good, but there's also this mysterious missing condition that no one can quite pin down, and it's something that Gettier is pointing out, that it can't just be that you get the justified true belief because of a random lucky circumstance, but how can we express a condition that requires that the belief is justified and true not due to luck, but due to the skill or the connection between the evidence and the facts that make it true. I mean, if we had more time and if this was a more focused class on epistemology, as sometimes over at Chapman, I teach a whole semester just on this one topic and we read a whole bunch of literature. Um, but I, I'm a person who thinks that the uh, truth tracking account of Robert Nozick is the best solution to the problem. And basically what he says, it's going to be hard to say this in a brief format, but um, when you know something, it's not just that you happen to get it right in the actual world, but you would have still gotten it right in a different possible world if the truth value was reversed. So in all the cases that we have said, like say the barn wasn't behind that wall, then the person's belief would have been false. So it's only true in the actual world because of the luck that the barn is there. But if we imagine a different counterfactual circumstance in which we delete the barn, then he still has this belief, but it becomes a justified false belief. So that belief that he has based on the way that he formed it, it's not sensitive to the conditions under which it would be false. So he's not tracking when it's false. He's only you know, tracking it in the one case. It's not even tracking. He's just lucky to get it in the actual case as being correct. So counterfactual sensitivity to the truth value of the proposition. Some people say that's the right account. So co-variation between your belief status and the truth value of the proposition. So you wouldn't think it was true if it was false. And you would think it was true if it were true. In our case, if we modify the scenario such that the target proposition is false, the subject still would have believed it. You know, so like, um, I don't know, if my car had not been in that aisle, I still would have thought that it was in that aisle because I would have based my belief on the appearance of the other car. 
So I happen to get it right, but only in our actual world. If we imagine a counterfactual circumstance where I use the same belief formation method and we modify it such that the proposition is false, I would not have noticed that it was false. So sometimes when you know things, you would have caught if it was false because the evidence you're using is related to the conditions under which it would have been false. Anyways, just some food for thought for you guys. But now we can move ahead and we're done with Gettier, at least for now. <clears throat> So from here, the next piece for us to all talk about is um, one more author on the topic of epistemology, and then we're closing this unit of the course. Um, <clears throat> the next author is the very well-known and famous uh, René Descartes, French philosopher of the uh, 17th century. That's, that's the 1600s. So let me just open my notes to him in a separate notebook. <clears throat> so here's the author's name. Rene Descartes. Um, it's a French philosopher who lived from 1596 until 1650. And um, so he's French, he's from Paris. Um, the, uh, the name that he has is a French kind of pronunciation. So, I mean, um, you would want to say with a silent or soft S. It's not Descartes, as, you know, kind of butchering his name in an American way of saying it, but it would be Descartes. Um, not too important to know that. As, uh, it's not, it's like, philosophically relevant, but if you're ever talking about him, uh, you'd want to pronounce it properly. Now, he wrote a book in 1641, um, which is called The Meditations. Man, I couldn't get it in. I thought I would be able to fit it. Let me just do this again. Okay, The Meditations by Rene Descartes, 1641. And let me see if you have a question here, Spencer. For instance, if you had beeped the car alarm and heard it in the aisle, that would actually be knowledge. Well, sure. So if I had pushed the button, heard the beep, and then used that information as the basis to think that it was in that aisle, then that would have been fine. But here we go, Spencer. What if I had pushed the button and a different car had beeped? And what I didn't know is that this is the first time the battery has run out on my own button. And the other beeping car that was somehow coincidentally timed to coincide with me pushing the button was in that aisle, two cars away from where mine was. Then in that case, it would not have actually been knowledge. So if it was a correctly functioning beeping uh, mechanism, then yes, I would have derived the belief from the actual source, which is my car. And then that could have been considered knowledge. So essentially, yes, but I also wanted to give you a, a, another Gettier case based on your own example. Okay, so the meditations from Descartes, 1641. Um, the title, the actual full title is um, Meditations on First Philosophy, but oftentimes we just speak of it informally as Descartes' meditations or simply the meditations. Okay, now the meditations is a book which has six different chapters. And each of the six chapters is numbered as meditation one, two, three, four, five, and six. So instead of calling it chapter one through six, he calls them meditations one through six. And um, the lesson today, well, I think we'll probably need to expand it into part of Monday also, but no worries on that. It's about the first two chapters, so meditation one and two. So we're going to try our best today to at least open the discussion on meditation one and two. Later in the semester, um, a couple of weeks from now, when we get to one of our final topics, the philosophy of mind, we will actually read one more of the chapters of meditations. We'll read meditation six, the last chapter. So by the time the whole semester is over, you guys will have read um, half of this classic book in philosophy. Um, and I think that chapter one, two, and six are probably the most important anyway. I mean, there's important key information in the other three, but those are where most of the action is. So anyways, meditations from Descartes dated to this time, that's his life, and these are the two chapters we're gonna read. Um, okay, so now I wanna tell you a little bit about the historical context that he was writing within, and what the goal he had was in writing his book. Um, so in the 17th century, the 1600s, right, there's all kinds of impressive major advances happening in all types of different um, fields within the academy. Um, so we're having basically like an explosion of all kinds of secular and scientific knowledge, much of it which had been suppressed in the um, 
middle ages and the medieval um, Christian era. Um, so for example, we're starting to learn about principles of physics from Newton's laws that are being developed. Calculus is being developed by Leibniz and by Newton. Um, Descartes was not only a philosopher, he was also a mathematician and a geometrician. And he is actually the person who's responsible for developing what we call the Cartesian coordinates. It's named after him, Cartesian. Um, so we have these advances in geometry, calculus, trigonometry, astronomy. Um, Galileo, Copernicus have discovered that um, using newly invented telescopes that we orbit the sun and not the other way around. And Kepler is discovering um, properties of the elliptical orbits of the celestial bodies. Um, in <clears throat> biology, we're learning that the ultimate unit of biological material is the cell. And um, human anatomy is growing and we're learning more about medicine. Um, even within art, there's now more realistic three-dimensional representation of painting because the depth of field has been discovered by uh, these kinds of painters and artists. So anyway, human knowledge is growing by leaps and bounds, advancing rapidly during that time that he's living, uh, living the time he's alive. And um, he wanted to do this. He said, let's try and make sure that this rapidly growing body of human knowledge that we're propping up is founded on a solid, firm foundation. Use a metaphor of architecture, if you will, okay? Conceive of the body of human knowledge as like a towering structure that we're building on top of. What he's saying is, we don't wanna to have to, at some future date, go back to our fundamental assumptions at the bottom and realize they were false. And if that happens, it's like gonna cause the whole structure of human knowledge to collapse like a big towering structure that's built on a loose foundation of quicksand or whatever. So he says, let's make sure to get off on the right foot and place a solid foundation stone underneath this enterprise of human knowledge that we're embarking upon. So that's the goal of the meditations book. The meditations is his quest for certainty. He thinks the thing that serves as the foundation stones of knowledge for human beings has to be stuff that is absolutely certain meaning something that could never be doubted, something that could never even have any chance to be false. So the meditations is his pursuit of the question, <clears throat> what is it that we can know for total certain? And whatever that is, whenever we discover it, and he hopes that we can in his book, whatever that thing is, that's gonna be these pillars uh, that serve as the foundations that will undergird this towering and growing structure of human knowledge. So it's a quest for certainty. That's the point of the meditations. Um, but don't take it from me. Here the authors say it. So here Descartes will talk to you. He says this. This is the very beginning of the book, first meditation. So he says, some years ago, I was, one thing before I start reading it, just about his style. I like to comment on this because I think it's a nice sort of breath of fresh air. Oftentimes, philosophy, especially in the modern day, you know, stuff that's been written in the 20th and 21st century, we place a high priority on being as technical and specific and like clear as possible. But sometimes that can seem a little dry, a little overly academic, and sometimes not fun. Uh, one thing about Descartes that I think is cool is that he's one of those more expressive and colorful writers. He has a kind of novelistic and a literary flair with the way he writes. So at any rate, it makes it a little more of a joy to read. Uh, but but I digress. So here's what he says to begin the uh, book of meditations. Some years ago, I was struck by the large number of falsehoods that I had accepted as true in my childhood. You guys can probably relate to that. When you're a little kid, sometimes you believe things that later on you're like, how silly was that? I can't believe I really thought that. I must have been so young. So he says that I had accepted. Some years ago, I was struck by the large number of falsehoods that I had accepted as true in my childhood and by the highly doubtful nature of the whole structure that I had therefore based on them afterwards. I realized that it was necessary once in the course of my life to demolish everything completely and start right again from the foundations if I wanted to establish anything at all in the sciences that was stable and likely to last. But the task looked enormous and I began to wait until I should reach a mature enough age to ensure that no subsequent time of life would be more suitable for tackling such an inquiry. This led me to put it off for so long that now I would be to blame if by pondering over it any further, I wasted the time still left for carrying it out. So today, I have rid myself of all worries and arranged for myself a clear stretch of free time. Now I'm ready, I'm quite alone, and at last I will devote myself sincerely and without reservation to the general demolition of my opinions. 
Okay, so he's now ready to embark on this mission or journey towards what we could absolutely know for total certain that can never be doubted. Now, how are we going to find out what's certain? Descartes says, I got you. Here's a method that he says you should use. So Descartes says, if you're trying to discover what is absolutely certain, then you have to employ what he calls the method of doubt. Okay, so here's the method of doubt from Descartes' meditations. Key concept and a major idea from this book. Method of doubt. <clears throat> so what the method of doubt says is to assume to be false, assume to be false, anything and everything that could even possibly be doubted. Okay, so I'll put it here and then we will discuss. Trying to make sure I'm not confusing you with my penmanship. Okay, there you go. So, assume to be false anything that can even possibly be doubted. Okay, now what is it to doubt something? To doubt something is to think maybe it's not true. Okay, so like if somebody told you, um, yeah, I've got $10 billion in the bank, and you, you, you know that they live in like a small apartment, you might be like, is this person telling the truth? I kind of doubt that, you know. You don't think it's true. You think it's something someone said. Sometimes it's not about statements that people make. You might just doubt your own judgment. You know, like you thought, um, you like you doubt your own memory. You're like, I thought that I uh, dropped those shoes off at my friend's house, but now I'm starting to forget. Did I really do that? Maybe that didn't happen. I actually kind of doubt it. Um, so doubt is just any condition that causes you to think that a particular concept or statement is false or a state of affairs is not the case. What the method of doubt says is this. We want you to take doubt to the absolute extreme. So if there's any possible way this, that something could be false, then let's just assume straight off that it actually is totally false. And um, that means that it doesn't have to be very likely that it's false. Even if it's like 0 .000, million more zeros, 1% chance that it's false, then it's not totally certain. And that one, let's assume it's false. And we keep doing this and going on through our belief system and all our beliefs until we finally find something that we cannot regard as false. And then the method of doubt, sort of as a process of elimination, will have exposed those things that are certain, and then we found the certainty that we were looking for to serve as that sort of pillar beneath the body of knowledge. Okay, so that's the method of doubt. Um, when I was a college student, a long time ago now, I had a professor that was teaching me this stuff, and he had an example that I thought was a little helpful. So let me pass it down to you. Um, Suppose that you were over in like the grocery store trying to purchase an apple from the produce section. And suppose that you were really, um, really trying to make sure that this was like the absolute perfect specimen of an apple. So you don't want just any old apple. You want it to be like ideal. You want it to be unblemished, perfect. Um, no marks, no bruises, no divots or blemishes on the apple. Um, I don't know why you'd want that. Maybe you're trying to purchase it as a gift from one of your professors like they did in the olden days. But whatever the case is, you want this perfect apple. So you go to the apple bin and you pull one out and you're like, this I think is it. It could be the one. It looks great. But as you inspect it a little more closely, you turn it around and you're like, ah, no, there's that one little slight imperfection on that side. So it's not perfect enough. On to the next. Toss this one aside and let's keep going through there until we find that perfect unblemished case. Now it's a metaphor I'm giving you. In Descartes' method of doubt, we're not sorting through apples in a bin, but we are going through the beliefs in our belief system exposing them to the highest light of scrutiny. And if there's any possible chance they could be incorrect or false, we'll assume they are for the sake of argument at least and on to the next and continue in the same way until hopefully we arrive at something in that belief system that has no possible chance of being false. So now we're on to the method of doubt. Let's go ahead and see what the method of doubt um, eliminates in terms of beliefs. So, <laughs> the method of doubt is pretty hardcore because with the method of doubt, it's almost everything that you can doubt, just to let you know. Um, Descartes comes right out and he says this, based on the method of doubt, all of your beliefs that are based on and derived 
from sense perception could all be doubted. This, so therefore, we're going to assume all of them are false. So let me say this. All beliefs that are based on sense perception can be doubted. All right, <clears throat> so what is sense perception? Sense perception is use of the five physical senses to determine information about your environment and the things that you're uh, perceiving. So five senses, sight, taste, touch, hearing, and smell. Think about how much of your beliefs about the world are based on those five senses. Right now, you believe that you're attending a live stream um, on YouTube. And the reason you believe that is why? Well, I mean, probably obvious, right? Because you can see the screen in front of you, because you can hear the voice projected at you through the speaker. Um, so that's visual and, and auditory information. Sometimes we use our other senses. You smell like a barbecue uh, out in the environment, and then you come to believe that there's someone cooking meat because you perceive it through the nose. In some cases, maybe you're driving and you don't want to look over because you don't want to take your eyes off the road, but you're like, where's my phone? Is it on the passenger seat? And so you just kind of fish around with your right hand until you feel in the grasp of your hand the tactile quality of the contour of the phone. And then even if you're not looking, you might just have the touch that tells you that it's there. So that's something that you believe based on touch. Um, so whether it's sight, taste, touch, hearing, smell, that's a large mainstay source of information that we have about our world. Um, Imagine how much less that you would know about what's going on if you didn't have all five of those five senses, or at least some of them. So anyway, what the author is saying, Descartes, is that all of the beliefs that are based on sense perception can be doubted. So let's ask, how is it possible for your sense perception to be incorrect? Can it ever be the case that you believe you perceive something with your five senses, but you're actually wrong? Can that happen? Can anyone think of such an example where your senses fail you? Some of these kinds of examples I, we've probably mentioned in other points in the semester, but I'm sure you have your own thoughts. Um, any kind of case where your perception by means of the five senses is actually incorrect. Can you tell me such a possible case? I mean, is your vision ever off? Is your hearing ever off? Et cetera, et cetera. Let me know. <clears throat> So, or do you think that perception is 100% accurate, it's never wrong, we never have a misperception of the data that's given by sensation? So you say maybe under the influence of alcohol, that's one case, Isaac, sure. If you're really, really drunk, um, you might have sensory motor impairment and you might have a hard time judging things. So you might misjudge the quality of your perceptual um, material. Alan, maybe if your hands go numb so you think you're not touching something when they are, that's a good case too. Yeah, your foot could fall asleep. This has happened to me. So weird. And then if it does, like you might not even notice that there's like some object touching it or that it's pinned under something. That's also fair. Correct. There's optical illusions of all sorts. You know, you're in a very hot environment and you see what you think is a body of water off in the distance, but that's just a phenomenon of heat as it plays on the visual system. You can place a uh, straight metal object like a knife into a body of water and at the water line it may appear that there's bent uh, a curvature in the in the knife but actually that's just the refraction of light as it is affected through the passage of the water to your eye um, the prior example of the drug elephant yes hallucination is one case the game of telephone can show you yes tina how testimony that passes from one to another can sometimes mistake some of the details in the original message. Alicia, when you're not wearing glasses or contacts and you read something wrong, sure. Now these are all familiar cases of perceptual error. Um, but now I wanna ask you about something even bigger than that. Could it be that you're wrong about even the belief that you have right now that you're watching this lecture on YouTube from wherever, from your, um, from your home or from wherever you're at? What do you think would have to be the case for you to be wrong about that? Like right now, you're not watching a YouTube lecture. How could that possibly be false? How could the statement, right now you're watching a YouTube lecture, how could that be false? How could that possibly be false? Because Descartes is going to say it could be. 
And what do you think is the example that he will give as to how that could possibly be something that's not correct? What possible way could you be wrong about your current situation here? Okay, there you go, River. Yeah, you could be dreaming. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, come on, I know I'm not dreaming, though, because when I'm dreaming, it's not so clear like this is. You know, this is vivid. This is sharp. And when I'm dreaming, things are vague and they're ambiguous and indistinct. But Descartes says, no, I'm not going to let you have that. Because, first of all, if you've been dreaming for your entire life, then you have nothing to contrast against the vividness and clarity of this current experience. So it's possible that when you go to sleep at night and you think that's the dream state and then you wake up and that's the waking state, that sleeping at night is a dream within a bigger dream. And the larger dream, you've never been awake from. If that's the case, then you can't possibly rule out the possibility that right now you're like, in some kind of dormant or sleeping state, merely having the experience of these waking thoughts and experiences, but they're all illusory. So when you have dreams, sometimes you have dreams that make you think that what's happening in the dream is happening in life, in reality. That happens to me quite often. I don't know what it says about me, but sometimes I think the most memorable dreams that I have are the ones that are not the most pleasant for some reason. So I have like a dream where something bad's happening something scary even. Um, in some cases, I've had these dreams where I take a wrong turn as I'm driving along like a steep roadway, and now I'm careening off the side, gonna die. And you know, I'm freaking out in the dream, going through all those horrifying thoughts, but then I wake up and I'm like, sweet, I'm not dead, I get to keep living, and that was just all fake. But in the dream state, you know, you thought it was real. Um, or you could even have interactions with other people. I'm hanging out with my friends, we're about to go on vacation, and then I wake up and I'm like, wow, I wasn't with anybody. I was just alone in my bed the whole time. So, because there's no short way to distinguish waking from being asleep, the author says that you cannot rule out the possibility right now, even if it's a remote possibility, even if we're not going to say, oh, that's very likely. You can't absolutely, completely rule out the possibility that right now you're in the midst of a big dream and none of this stuff is real. Or if you want to update his scenario for the 21st century, let's go with the simulation thing. You guys heard about that? Maybe you're living in a simulation right now. And all the events and surroundings of the world are mere illusions produced by the computer simulation that you're a part of. And the programmers are controlling it all or whatever. So I'm not trying to place stock in these ideas. I'm not trying to say like, oh, and this is very well probable. We're only saying that it's a very, very far out possibility. And according to the method of doubt, that's all we need. Once it's possible that something's incorrect, we are going to just full on assume it is false. So based on the method of doubt, here's where we are at. None of this is real. You are dreaming. And the entire external world is a big dream and illusion that you're having. At least until we can prove otherwise, we're going to base ourselves off of that assumption. Now, this can sort of be structured into a formal argument. And so the sort of dreaming doubt argument that Descartes um, implying here with his argument and his writing is this. Two premises. The first one, to know anything from sense perception <clears throat> to know anything from sense perception, I must first know, I must know that I'm not dreaming. But the second premise just bluntly says, but there is no way to know you're not dreaming. But there is no way to know. And I'm not dreaming. So therefore, I don't know anything from sense perception. So there we have the makings of a kind of argument that's based along the lines we've described here. Starting with this first premise, to know anything from sense perception, I would have to know that I'm not dreaming. But there is no way to know this. There is no way to know that I'm not dreaming. And so therefore, since I would have to know this, to know anything from sense perception, I just don't know anything from sense perception. Um, 
No sure signs by means of which being awake can be distinguished from being asleep. If you were in the midst of a very realistic kind of dream, um, then there'd be no way that you could compare the quality of its vividness to like a real experience if you've never actually had one. Um, and suppose that you are in reality, take the concept of a simulation. If there was such a simulation, what would it be like? It would be like this. So of course there would be no means by which you could distinguish the two cases. So that really leaves us in a bit of a predicament. We are trying to find out what is certain and Descartes starting off with taking a lot of stuff away and saying the method of doubt is not giving us any certainty. In fact, it's just telling us that we don't know a whole bunch of stuff because we can't absolutely guarantee that they're true. Um, let me read and you'll hear how he says it. He says this, whatever I have up till now accepted as true, I have acquired either from the senses or through the senses, but from time to time I have found that the senses deceive. Continuing from there, he says, well, although the senses occasionally deceive us with respect to objects which are very small or in the distance, there are many other beliefs about which doubt is quite impossible, even though they are derived from the senses. He kind of does this thing where he like goes back and forth and he plays devil's advocate against his own arguments. So right now he's trying to speak in the voice of an imaginary critic to his first claim that, you know, um, we can doubt a lot of stuff from sense perception. He says, I mean, I know that I'm here sitting by the fire wearing a winter dressing gown, holding a piece of paper in my hands. How could these be denied? He says below, well, as if I were not a man who sleeps at night and regularly has all the same experiences while asleep as madmen do while awake. Indeed, sometimes even more improbable ones. How often asleep at night am I convinced of familiar events like this, that I'm sitting by the fire in my dressing gown when in fact I'm lying undressed in bed. Yet at the moment, my eyes are certainly wide awake. When I look at this piece of paper, I shake my head and it is not asleep. You know, kind of think about, he's talking about like, you know, I'm pinching myself. I can feel it. I, doesn't that mean I'm not asleep? He says, all this would not happen with such clarity to someone asleep. But then he reports against himself, indeed, as if I did not remember other occasions when I have been tricked by exactly similar thoughts while I was asleep. As I think about this more carefully, I see plainly that there are never any sure signs by means of which being awake can be distinguished from being asleep. Okay, so sense perception is all ruled out. So if you're following the method of doubt and you're the meditator, right now you're in this position. Maybe the entire external world and everything in it is not real and is just an illusion that I'm having as I'm dreaming. So what could be maybe more certain than the sense perception? Well, you might think that we could find a better source of certainty in stuff like math, logic, geometry. That's his next move, to consider this realm. Why would that perhaps seem to some people to be more certain? Well, because of this. Even if everything's an illusion, you could argue that no matter what, still one plus one equals two, or that there's still three sides to a triangle, because those statements don't even involve any reference to space and time. Like one plus one is two is just a formal mathematical truth. It's not saying like Biden is the president or something. So it doesn't make any reference to events within space and time. So you might say, whether I'm awake or asleep, I know a triangle has three sides. So how about that? Now I've got some certainty to work with. But even there, as much as that sounds good, Descartes says, actually, no, that's also not totally certain. But the reason he gives why even math and logic can be doubted, it's kind of a weird reason. So here's what he says. First, he says he's a believer in God. And by the way, everyone in uh, literate circles within Europe at the time would have been of another Christian. So he knows that his audience believes in God, too. And he says, okay, we all believe in this almighty God. God has infinite power, as we've studied earlier in the semester, if he exists. So he's omnipotent. And that means he can do anything he wishes to do through his will. No limits. So if God wanted to, he says, with that awesome power that he has, he could be a person or a, a being who <clears throat> causes you to think that you're doing an elementary mathematical summation correctly, but you're actually doing it wrong. So like... You try and add up the sides of a triangle and you say it's three and it's so obvious and that can never be wrong. But somehow God is messing with your brain or mind such that you think that's obvious and irrefutable. But in fact, he's deceiving you in such a way that that's not the case. Um, so you understand he's saying that God with his awesome power, if he really wanted to, he could make even fundamental things like math and geometry incorrect when they seem so much obviously true to you. But having said this, he does reverse himself. He says, okay, I just claim that God could do that because he's got unlimited power. And it's true, he could do it. But he adds, but that he wouldn't do it though. Even though God could deceive you about basic facts, about math, logic, geometry, whatever, 
He could do that because he got all the power, but he wouldn't want to do it. What do you think it is about God that Descartes says would make him not want to manipulate your beliefs about math and, and so forth? Because God, they say, is omnipotent, but there's also another piece. God, they say, is also what? And this other thing is supposed to be why he thinks God would just not ever choose to deceive you in that way. Why do you think Mr. Descartes says that God, although he could, he, he just wouldn't, though, deceive you about one plus one is two or three sides on the triangle? Why do you think he says that he would not do it even if he could? Because <clears throat> he's all good, exactly, Isaac, because he's claimed as um, infinitely good, omnibenevolent. And if he's setting us up just to fail, like if he's built us his creations just so that we make obvious mistakes about math, even when it seems so obvious to us, I'm not talking about tough math, like long division, where you, you could legitimately make an error, even if you had enough time to think about it. We're talking about like one plus one is two, two plus two equals four, three sides on a triangle, that kind of very elementary stuff. Um, so God could mess with your beliefs about this such that they're wrong, even though they seem correct. But since he's perfectly good, he wouldn't do it. Having said that, though, Descartes next claims this. So God wouldn't do it, even though he could. But that doesn't mean that there couldn't be something else manipulating you like that. So he says, uh, assume there were an evil demon that had control over what you perceive and think is real, and that this evil demon could therefore be manipulating your mathematical and geometric beliefs. Now, the evil demon doesn't have perfect goodness, so he's not constrained by God's constraint to not ever be able to do something that runs counter to being omnibenevolent. So this would be like a being that's below God, but somehow above us in terms of power and control. And the evil demon, therefore, he outsources the possibility of deception to the evil demon, away from God and to the evil demon. Now, you might be hearing that and be thinking, wow, that's pretty off the wall. But keep in mind, he's writing this in 1641. 1641, they didn't have the example of, like, the mad scientist who's got your brain in a vat, who's feeding it, like, electrochemical stimuli so that it has the perceptions of the external environment around it. In a modern context, if it was the Matrix or, like, Inception or something, you might have that kind of example. Aliens put you in a pod, and they stimulate your brain to think that you're walking around, but you're really in the matrix. Um, well, Descartes working in a time where we don't have the idea of computer simulations and all of that. So he's using dreams and the possibility of evil demons. But if you want to export like a different example uh, from the evil demon, if that's just too weird to you, then think of it as like some mad scientist and in another dimension, like a Rick and Morty type scenario, you know, where this guy controls everything that you perceive, um, but he's not perfectly good like God. So that'd be like Rick. I don't know if you guys know the cartoon. Anyway, though, you understand the point. God could make your beliefs wrong about this stuff because he could do anything, but he wouldn't do it. Nonetheless, maybe the evil demon could, so it still remains possibly doubtful. He says this. <clears throat> a reasonable conclusion might be that physics, astronomy, medicine, and other disciplines which depend on the study of things that we perceive are doubtful. But arithmetic, geometry, and subjects like that, which deal only with the most general things, regardless of whether they really exist or not, contain something certain. Because whether I'm awake or asleep, two and three added together makes five, and a square has four sides. It seems impossible that such obvious truths could incur any suspicion of being false. But then he says, but yet firmly rooted in my mind is the longstanding belief that there is an omnipotent God. How do I know that he has not brought it about, that there is no such uh, earth, sky, extension, shape, size, place, while at the same time making these things appear to me to exist just as they do now? But below he says this, but perhaps God would not have wished me to be deceived in this way, since he is said to be supremely good. Um, so then below that he says, perhaps there may be some who would prefer to deny the existence of so powerful a God rather than believe that everything else is uncertain. Let us not argue with them. I will suppose, therefore, that not God who is supremely good and the source of all truth, but rather some malicious demon of the utmost power and cunning has employed all his energies in order to deceive me. I shall think that the sky, air, earth, color, shapes, sounds, and all external things are merely the delusions of dreams which he has devised to ensnare my judgment. I shall consider myself as not having hands or eyes, flesh or blood or senses, but falsely believing that I have these things, and I will stubbornly and firmly persist in this meditation. Um, even if it is not in my power to know any truth, I will at least do what is in my power, that is to resolutely guard against accepting anything false, so that the deceiver, however powerful and cunning they may be, will be unable to impose on me in the slightest degree. So um, as we close the meeting today, and we'll, we'll finish off the last piece of the day on Monday when we come back from the weekend, I want you to understand how far-reaching this method of doubt implication is that we're supposed to like now suggest that all sense perception is false. 
That means that even your own body and your physical appearance is also to be assumed false. So like, according to the method of doubt, this body and appearance that you think you have could just be a dream body that you're having within the illusion. Maybe in fact, you have no physical frame whatsoever and you're just a disembodied soul, like a ghost dreaming all of this. Or maybe you're like a vapor or a gas cloud or something and the appearance of your body is just yet another element of the wholesale illusion that you're involved in. So when you think about Descartes' method of doubt, you're not supposed to be thinking, me that looks like this is dreaming in some other realm of reality while the reality I'm exposed to is false. Even particulars about yourself, aside from, well, I don't want to spoil this, the, the content of chapter two, so I'm not going to say much more about that, but at least your physical frame, you can't say you know for sure. There might be something about you, though, that is certain that even the method of doubt can't touch, and that's the next thing that we want to talk about. So this is the end of meditation one. At the end of meditation one, end of the first chapter, it's kind of like a cliffhanger. It's like, are we going to get any knowledge? Stay tuned. Are we going to get anything, or is this method of doubt going to take it all away from us? But when meditation two begins, we get to start slowly and steadily building back up our body of knowledge from ground zero. Um, and in the end, by the time we get to the end of his meditations, you're going to know something. Descartes doesn't just say, hey, the world's a big dream and it's all fake. So how about that? He says that at the beginning of the book to sort of test our intuitions. But at the end of his book, he does a long and winding loop back to everyday common sense. Yes, the world exists. Yes, there are other minds. Yes, your perception of things is basically accurate to the reality, but he doesn't want to assume those things as givens, which we usually just do as we take it for granted. He wants to be able to prove it through a very deliberate course of argument, step by step. So in the end, Descartes doesn't just say everything's fake and false and you're dreaming. He uses this methodologically, but eventually he does return back to our everyday conception of reality, which he thinks is now better justified due to the meditations. So anyway, guys, that's all I have for us today, and we're out of time. But I appreciate you uh, hanging in there and sticking with the class and doing all the readings. Keep reading those books um, and essays. Keep attending as much as you can, and I'll be in touch with you if you've asked me about any grades or anything else um, in the coming days. So are we all good? If so, I'm going to close the stream, and you guys can have a good weekend, and I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm. Any issues with the... Uh, Okay, yeah, sorry. I thought I was timing out for a second. On my phone, it looked like there was a little lag. Okay, guys, have a great one then. Thanks again, as usual, and I'll see you after the weekend. Okay, bye-bye.